Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Joe, and I'm a real alcoholic. Through God's grace and because this program works each day in my life. And the next day, me take a drink of alcohol since March the 10th, 1962. And for this, I'm extremely grateful. It's, uh, my first time really, or my second time in this part of the country, first time to talk in AA, and it's, I say I've had many experiences in this. But it seems like there's always something new and new places to go in Alcoholics Anonymous, and it's just a, been a great day today. I was telling the guys on the front row, everybody was complaining about the heat, talking about it's hot. I said, you ought to come to Arkansas. Uh, we would call it the cold snap. I was telling the guys on the front row the other day, I, uh, I came on the news that we, they found two trees arguing over a dog. You know, it was so hot. <laughs> but I say I am a, a being an alcoholic. I uh, uh, one time in my life. And that's what this is all about. This NAA that we talk about that I suffered from an illness, which only a spiritual experience could conquer. And as a result of the program in the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous, through the practice of that program, through God working in my life, I haven't time necessarily to take a drink. And this is what these things are all about, to tell what it was like and what happened and what it's like right now. I think uh, it's fascinating to me and a great challenge these times. And many times have I done this, is to talk about these three facets of my life. I could talk to you quite a bit tonight about how it was for me and a I think a certain amount of this is necessary for us to identify with each other. Uh, I could talk a lot about the, the many things that have happened to me in Alcoholics Anonymous, the many miracles of my life. You know, miracles are simply getting what you need when you need it, and I get that every day in Alcoholics Anonymous. The miracles are no big deal. But I think the greatest thing that we need to discuss, regardless of where we are on the road or sobriety, even like some of you people tonight are, like some of us have been around many years on, the, the fantastic things is what did happen in our lives? The miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous. How to reapply this on an everyday basis in our lives. You know, I hear a lot of people get up behind these podiums and talk about all the things they lost through drinking. I'm going to have to disappoint you tonight. I, I've been an alcoholic all my life, I guess. I started out as an alcoholic. Uh, and I, I really never lost anything through drinking. That's strange. Drinking never let me get anything, you know. I never got anything. <laughs> if I hadn't been an alcoholic, I never would have amounted to nothing. You know, that's really what it was all about. But I, uh, I remember how I, uh, my first drink, and I remember my last drink. I remember a few things that happened in between them two drinks. Uh, but I, uh, uh, I was born, my home is in Louisville, Kentucky. I, I, I was raised in the neighborhood. We, they call it the ghetto now, but we call it the neighborhood. <laughs> uh, and we were poor people. I mean, quite now. We didn't know we was poor because everybody was poor. You know, it's hard to know when you're poor when everybody else is poor. And I got plenty to eat because, uh, I know I've got plenty to eat because every time I asked for my, some more, my mother said, you've had a plenty. So I guess i got plenty to eat. <laughs> and as I look back on my life, it was, uh, it's the only one I know. I can't call it average or nothing. You know, my life is not average, it's mine. It's the only one I've ever lived. I had a lot of things going on in my life as a young person, really all my life. In fact, Dr. Silkhorst describes me totally, totally, when he says I was restless, irritable, and discontent. You know, all my life. I, I can't never remember 
for a of not being a restless man. I never did fit in. I never was as good as a part of wherever setting I was in. Nowhere. And finally, one night I was introduced to alcohol. I was 18 years old. And I, I didn't know what was going on. I remember that first drink, and I remember what happened. And I never, and nothing in my life, I was telling someone today, nothing is, is explains the, the, my life as well as the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. I can not add any words better than the explanations of my life is in this book. And Dr. Silkworth said that I, that night I experienced the sense and ease and comfort they came at once by taking a few drinks of alcohol. Probably some relief came into my life that night that I probably needed. I often wondered what would happen had I not taken that drink. But I instantly remember that. You know, that's, and, and, and every, every drink I ever took was for that sense and ease and comfort. And alcohol gave me that and didn't give, didn't give me any trouble. And somewhere along the line, you know, alcohol started causing troubles in my life immediately. And, you know, I never could differentiate the truth from the false. I could always see what alcohol was giving me. Never until the bitter end could I see what it was doing to me. And I pursued this great illusion to the gates of insanity. Are dead. Now, I feel I'm very blessed as an alcoholic tonight. And I think sometimes we take this thing for granted, you know. You know, most alcoholics today in our community, in this community, any given community across this country, across this world, you know, the millions of alcoholics, most alcoholics will never realize they're alcoholics. You know what I mean? We are the only alcoholics that know the alcoholics. The rest of them don't know what's the matter with them. You know, alcoholism is a very strange illness. It's the only illness in the world that tells the patient you ain't got it. That's the way you can tell who's got it. The one that swears he ain't got it's got it. You know, I ask one of these social drinkers, you say, you know, you might be an alcoholic. He say, I might be. He ain't got it. <laughs> yeah. So I had something all my life that I didn't know I had. And that's, you, you're really in trouble. And the first step to recovery is to realize that you got it and realize what it is. It took me many years to do that. I went through a lot of problems with drinking. As I said, I, I never really could drink. I, I, boy, I never. Yeah, it's the only thing I worked at and got worse. From started from the top and went down. You know, this this went down. Uh, I got married. You know, we alcoholics do that. Uh, we take hostages <laughs> along the way. <laughs> yeah, uh, we have to have some foul nine when we get here. But uh, <laughs> I wish I. So I took some hostages and. <laughs> Went through that. <coughs> Alcoholism began to grow right along with the young marriage. Five years we were divorced and had about two kids in that marriage and nothing but total trouble. Total trouble. Never had marriage, never had a change, nor I had a change. I was, by that time I was, uh, 25, 26 years old. And you know how alcoholics, but I know how alcoholics do when they get in trouble. They go back home to mom and dad. You know? There I was, been all the way around the circle, back home with mom and dad, and 25, my life's over, 25 years old. You know, I would always go see my relatives when I got broken in trouble. I would say, now that's not right, y'all go see your father. You know? And his, he wasn't like the prodigal of son's father, he wasn't glad to see me, he put his hand on his pocketbook and he wouldn't give me no action whatsoever. <laughs> Only time he would ever help me out, he would always lend me some money to leave, you know. <laughs> I would go on these excursions and not getting too far away. And uh, and I would come home and I'd tell him, I don't like this town. I can't make money. He says, you want to borrow some money? He would lend me some money to leave. And it was on one of these occasions that this is the way I got into Arkansas. Uh, today, I, I feel like that I'm a very blessed person. 
I feel like that God has worked something special in my life. You know, I, uh, today I, I feel like that I, uh, not only God has given me a good life, a new life in Alcoholics Anonymous, but I think God has given me a purpose for my life. You know, I work with other alcoholics. I run a little non-profit treatment center, and I work with alcoholics. I have been for 17 years. And I think that's my purpose in life. I think every one of us here, you know, God created you. He created you for a purpose, and you're on the face of this earth for something. And I think when the happiest you're ever going to be is when you find out why you were supposed to be here. And I feel like, you know, that this is maybe was God's reason for making that choice in me. Yeah, you know, for giving me that his grace, for giving me that insight to see my problem and find recovery so that I could fulfill my purpose. But it didn't seem like the beginning of a great purpose when I came to Little Rock, Arkansas thirty years ago. I came there like I did everywhere on the Greyhound bus. You know what I mean? Broke. I remember the night that I got there. I had about four dollars in my pocket when I got there. And I had a little small raggedy suitcase. So I wonder about that today. You know how much? You know progress is something else. You, know, you got today when I travel, I gotta have my razor and I gotta. Have, I didn't have none of that stuff. You know, I had a little raggedy suitcase, a little drunk suitcase. Now, if you don't understand alcoholic suitcases, alcoholic suitcases have a, a la- one latch on them. The other one's broke. Yeah. And you tie a necktie around them. You know that's the way I travel. Now, there at the treatment center every day, we see new people coming in, and they trill, got the same kind of suitcase. I watch them, and all the latches is broke. <laughs> About a year ago, we had a guy come in there, and we got excited, man. We said, man, we got to get him out of here. He can't make the program. This guy had alligator luggage. You can't get sober with alligator luggage. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, I could always find me a job. I was a real alcoholic. I had several professions. You know, that's the way we alcoholics are. And, you know, you got to have a lot of professions if you're a real alcoholic. Uh, I had a guy come to me some years later after I was working with alcoholics. He told me, he said, I want to set up, he wanted to get one of these great big government grants to train alcoholics. I told him, I didn't know none need training. I know a lot need untraining, you know. <laughs> but anyway... I got me a job and I went to live with my sister and you have to really imagine, know her to really understand this part of my story. My sister, uh, been, she's just one of those normal people. She, she's terminally normal. You know what I mean? <laughs> she's just been that way all her life. You know, never had no excitement like I had, you know. Uh, and she went to church all her life and she sings in the choir and she's got a beautiful voice and she plays the organ and the piano. She goes, she's been into music all her life. She's a school teacher, too. My God, yeah. It's boring, isn't it? Uh, well, she was. At, she had gotten married and, and moved down to Arkansas and went to college. And of course, when I got in trouble and my, my father didn't want me no more and my family didn't want me no more, I said, you ought to go see your sister. That's not right, treating her that way. So this is the way I came to Little Rock. And I got me a job when I got there, and I said, uh, uh, every Sunday they would get up to go to church. And this is kind of embarrassing. You know how you, they think we don't care, but it does hurt. A nice young family. Her husband was a lay speaker of the church. Today he's a pastor of one of our larger United Methodist churches. Uh, but he was a lay speaker of the church, and she was the organist. Just fine, beautiful young people. And uh, I was, and I don't know why we drunk end up with those kind of people. And so one Sunday morning, they were they were inviting me to go to church, and after a while, they sounded like they were threatening me. So I decided to go to church with them. And this is where God put the first person in my life, Lubel, my alumni. Lubel is part of my recovery. I don't know where I'd be tonight or where I would be without her having to come into my life. But she was a good friend of my sister, and, and it happened that uh, my Lubel was in the choir. She's still in the same little choir, this little church. And, you know, the organist and the uh, choir members are pretty close. So Lou Bell was in the choir, and we she tells this different than I all nine talk. But that morning we met in the church. 
And I know how she felt seeing that nice-looking man at that time many years ago coming into the church. I had a good front. I had the organist and the lay speaker. That's the best camouflage you can get. <laughs> so we met there at the church. And you know how we alcoholics operate by selling a fast conversation with them slow-thinking al you know, I'll give them... <laughs> I give her my best shot that morning, and she hadn't recovered from that yet. That's been 30 years. <laughs> but you'd have to remember, now, I'm still working out of this suitcase. been there two or three weeks. Now, she's got a job, which she just retired from from 31 years. She had a brand-new car, and she owned her own little home, which we still live in this mighty little home. And I could thoroughly convince her how she needed me to take care of her. <laughs> boy, oh boy. That was my, I was at my best. <laughs> so we got married and, and we had a, well, I, I didn't let her three, we got married about 90 days. I didn't let her think too long. <laughs> and, uh, and, I had I took a honeymoon. We didn't have no money. We couldn't afford a honeymoon. She couldn't take off, but I took off for a week, you know. <laughs> uh, I was a go-getter. I took her to work and went and got her. And, and so I stopped in a good supply of liquor and stayed home and drank for a week. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I remember seeing, the, you know, she seen me drink. She knew I drank. But I could see, I remember seeing the reality come, come into her when she'd come home and see me. She began, it took about two or three days to figure out what she had, and she was shocked. You know? Now, I drank there all week, and I was, after, I drank a whole week around this week, Benja, because I was getting, I was in bad shape by this time, 26, 27 years old. And after one week of drinking, I made the, my first trip to the old drying out place. We didn't have the detox centers in those 62 and 60. And we didn't have, it was the last years of, uh, like Jim, and it was the old insane asylum. You know what I mean? The old nut houses is where they put you. So I, I've been married a week and I drank my way into the Arkansas insane asylum. It's still up there. In the stone. Uh, and you know, that's embarrassing. Brand new married man. Then drank yourself in the nut house. I know how she felt when she went to church some the first Sunday somebody said, Hi, it's married life, she said, That fool's in the nut house already. <laughs> she did me in, in one week. I tell everyone once in a while, I said, You're gonna run me crazy she said, Hell, you still an outpatient out there. They ain't never cut you loose. <laughs> But there I was, and I was the smartest guy in the nut house. Now, you know, nobody back in those days, they didn't talk to you about alcoholism. There weren't any meetings in there. They never mentioned it. I don't know what they were doing. And they, they let me out in about 10 days, and I had a problem. They didn't know the nature of my problem. I didn't know I had a problem. I didn't know what it was. So I was a victim of the problem. I left there and I stayed up a few weeks and I, I drank again. You know, I, I, I knew, I, I knew I had a problem. I knew drinking was involved. That wasn't a, I was on a, a scourge and I was a traveling drunk. I'd leave home and I was kind of drunk. He'd go send me to the store for a loaf of bread and I'd come back three months later. So I was kind of drunk. I was the spur of the moment I'd just take off. And I was on one of these drunks, I was in Kansas City, and I was down on 12th Street in Kansas City. Right there from 12th and Vine, those of you who heard about that song. And, uh, and it was, uh, I was in, drinking, morning drink was a part of my life, had been for many years. And I'd get up in the morning, I'd need a drink, and I'd go down to this bar. And one morning I went down there, and there wasn't anything in there but wino. And I wasn't a wino, unless every once in a while my money said wine. <laughs> and I lowered myself to go down there with these winos. Wasn't nobody else in there. And these winos were trying to get a, a pint of wine together. It was 60 cents. That was before inflation. 
And they were getting their pennies together, and I asked, oh, I had about $3. I said, that's okay, I'll buy. I was a big shot. And and so we bought the pint of wine, and they would pour the wine up in glasses. I know they wouldn't give them the bottles. I guess they, I don't know what they thought they'd do with them. But you'd say, give me a pint on three. That's the way. And they put three glasses, and then this girl, her name was Lucille, she would pour the wine, starting at the first glass right on down, and she would finish. And when she finished, the glasses would be level. She could really pour that wine out level. Of course, she did it a thousand times every day. And of course, I didn't know what was going on, but customs do change in bar to bar. And after she poured the wine, I noticed all the winos got out and looked at it. <laughs> Checking her out. And they finally determined that one glass did have a hair more than the other. And classy people as they were, they gave that to the man who bought. But that's class. You know, wino's got a lot of class. I don't know if y'all know that. And there I was helping my fellow man. There's a little wino named Van. God bless him. He, I remember it was in October. It was chilly. And I could hear the glass hitting his teeth and the tears running down his cheek from needing a drink in the chill of the morning, too. And we began to talk. And Van looked at me and he said, Joe, he said, you... You're a pretty nice guy. Well, I knew that. That wasn't no new information. And he said, you're a lot different from me. And you're a lot different from the rest of the guys down here on the street. Well, I knew that. But I guess he was getting my attention. The next thing he said, but Joe, you got one problem. I said, what's that? He said, you drinking too much. Hmm. You know, God works through the, in my life. I don't know about you. But he works through the most insignificant people. You know, I mean? you know, it's not the learned. It's the small, insignificant people. You know, I wrestled with that thing, and uh, I finally, after about three days of uh, getting drunk every day, and that thing wouldn't leave me. And I decided, that, you know, well, I do have a problem with drinking. See, I had a problem, and I didn't understand the problem. Now, I had, now, in order to solve a problem, the first step is to understand the exact nature of the problem. But I didn't understand the exact nature of it, but I understood the idea that, I got the idea that my problem was drinking. And I see a lot of people around AA think that's their problem. So obviously, if your problem is drinking, the solution is simple. Just quit drinking. That'll work if that ain't you, if that's your problem. But that wasn't my problem. My problem was never quit. Hell, I quit three times someday. I could quit. But my problem was I couldn't stop starting. <laughs> that was my problem. That was a starting problem, not a quitting problem. So I decided to quit. So I came back home and got back and, and got, uh, you know, went through the shakes and everything, went back to work, and I quit drinking, and I didn't take a drink for nine months. Because I had a lot of people tell me, all you got to do is quit drinking, and you know, everything's going to get fine. <laughs> but man, let me tell you, it didn't. I quit drinking. How would they look good? How would they, you know, everybody said, you're doing good. But I was still restless, irritable, and discontent. And the main thing, you know, even at that time, I couldn't experience the sense of ease and comfort. So it got worse and worse and worse. And one morning I took a drink, and I can identify, and I think it's associated with the experiences of the big book, when the book says, the day will come. And that day came, you know, when I did not within me have a defense against that first drink. I was so glad when I think this this is what the first 100 people did, they laid down their experiences. They laid down their lives for me. Their experiences so that I would have something to identify because I thought I was the only person in the world until I read this book and read their experiences you know, in, of their lives. And, you know, I took a drink that morning, and uh, I remember I was sort of like Jim in the big book. I said, you're really messing up as I took it. You know, I told myself. 
And I went to the well-known spree, and about six weeks later, I ended up on a bar one Saturday morning, and I don't think I was capable. I'm like every other alcoholic, you know, out there. I, through God's grace. Through God's grace, I was given a moment of reality of where I was with my life. All at once I was sitting down there, bar, I'd been like every other drunk. It wasn't any worse. I wasn't any bad as the rest of them. Didn't hurt anymore. But all at once I had a moment of clarity about where I was and what was going on in my life. And I had a, I had a total surrender sitting on that bar. Now, it wasn't to God, you know. I think a lot of people, you know, they take stuff out of context in the book. You know, they said we got to, the book just said we have to find God. Before that, it tells us why. And I don't think you ever really find God anyway. God ain't lost. He's been here a long time. It's hard to get lost if you've been here a long as I was lost. But I had to give up on me. And sitting on that bar stool, I had a moment of surrender. I gave up on me. And the next moment, I had some stupid idea about going back to this nut house. Now, I didn't know anything about Alcoholics Anonymous in those days. Alcoholics Anonymous was so anonymous in my community, <laughs> I had never heard of it. And so the only thing I knew about help was this old state hospital. And I had swore for two years that I would never go back there. And if I have never, if you had have been there, you would have swore the same thing. It wasn't the type of place you go. I mean, my God, you know, I hear people going to detox now eight and ten times. If you went back there twice, they'd put you on a nut war because you had to be crazy. It was just that bad. You know, you were locked up with total nuts. Now, the next thing I knew, I was getting off the bar stool, and I decided, well, I caught me a cab. And I had $2.50 in my pocket this morning. And this guy charged me $2 to drop me off. And I remember that Saturday morning on March 10, 1962, that I, I went to that old state hospital. And they took me in. You know, uh, there were about eight people on our ward, and they were not alcoholics. They, they wasn't an alcoholic ward, it was a nut ward. This was the back wards of the old segregated state hospital in those days. <clears throat> and on the black ward, there was people that had, there was guys that had been there. One guy that was there, he was 36 years old, and he had been there since he was six. You know, there's people been there 20 years. In other words, some of their people... Their family died, and they didn't have anybody raised. Some of them as kids, so they brought them around. They grew up there. And these were the long-term people in the in the state hospital. And when you went in those kind of wards, uh, you know, didn't nobody talk to you. Now the alcoholics on the ward, they, they were the class of the ward. It was the only place I've ever been where alcoholics was a status symbol. You know, we were the class of the war. Uh, I remember, see, I found out later what happened. See, all the, the these people had been there so long, some of them had anybody, hadn't had a visitor since they'd been there. Uh, they felt rejected. And we alcoholics got visitors and attention. The A's would talk to us. They treat us like humans. They treat them like dirt. So when you went in there, you didn't know who was who. So every time you asked one of them nuts what he was in there, all the nuts say, oh, I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> and quite naturally, every alcoholic, he said, I had a nervous breakdown. So... <laughs> When I first went in there, they didn't talk to me that much. And that was on a Saturday. And I thank God for, you know, it almost gets close to me when I talk about it. I thank God for Aura. Aura was a, was a patient on the ward. Uh, I was there at Monday. He walked up to me and sat down beside me. And he had a big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. You know, I, you know, I love the, the work of Paul. Paul says God's grace is sufficient. That's about all God can be. I think sometimes we expect so much more. So God is just enough. 
That's all he's a, every day he's just enough. And I didn't need a learned man at Alcoholics Anonymous. I didn't need Bill and Dr. Bahab. I didn't need a man with a lot. I just had Aura. Aura had two weeks of locked up sobriety. He had the big book Alcoholics Anonymous and a carton of camel cigarette. That's what got me. Now, nobody on this ward had a, had a ready roll at all. And this guy's got a whole carton of camels, and I'm broke. So he comes up to me, and he gets talking to me, and he gets giving me a cigarette. And then finally he said, you won't borrow a pack until your friends come out. I told him, yeah, but my friends never did come out. In fact, I didn't have none. So this guy, you know, let me smoke a cigarette. And I had been having trouble because I was out of cigarettes, and they gave me some roll your own tobacco and paper. I don't have any trouble talking about your life being unmanageable because the only way I could smoke was take my tobacco and the paper and give it to them nuts and let him roll it and lick it and give it back to me. Now, you know you ain't operating too good. And this guy's got a whole cart. So he sits down and he starts talking about I said for many years he started talking about the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. But, oh, I didn't know nothing about the big book Alcoholics Anonymous. And I think it's very important to me you know, I think about my sponsor. Uh, that that not only that I that I practice this in my life, but it's important to me individually, for me, that I live the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Because I'm sober tonight because three guys were living the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. Or I talked about these three guys and I, hey, he didn't know nothing about the book. So he talked to me incessantly about these three men from Alcoholics Anonymous. That Wednesday night over 25 years ago. Because a little guy gave me cigarettes. And was nice to me. The OA called AA meeting that Wednesday. And I left the back wards of that old state hospital 25 years ago. And I went out into an old dining room to an AA meeting and all I wanted was a cup of coffee and a cigarette and God gave me a brand new life God gave me a way of living that I never knew existed and tonight I know a little bit about heaven and all I wanted was a cup of coffee and a cigarette a gift unwarranted grace from a loving God and I met three real alcoholics. I thank God. I was sort of like Hallmark. He thought it up to send the very best. He sent some real alcoholics. He didn't send no chucks out there. And one of them became my sponsor. God bless him. He's 70 years old. He just had a serious operation. I was with him just before I left. But Charles was there that night. And he got up, and I always knew, you know, we alcoholics don't know it all. You can spot it one of us. You know, we alcoholics know everything. Don't know nothing about nothing, but you know, alcoholics can, can solve any kind of problem. We know it all. If you want to, like I heard a guy say the other day, if you want to, uh, if you got a problem you want to solve, go to the nearest Red Rooster Bar. You probably got one like that, and you'll get your answers. They will be there. Now, don't go on Saturday night. The amateurs are there on Saturday night. <laughs> the authorities are there on Tuesday morning. <laughs> you know, we know it all. And I knew it all, and I, I had already predetermined what these AAs were. My idea of alcoholic anonymous was something like plain clothes salvation army. I know they didn't have uniform, but the same thing, you know. And sure, you know, I know they was going to meddle in your business, and I didn't want to meddle in my business. But these guys, they didn't meddle in my business. I said, if he says anything about me, I'm going to tell him off. But this idiot got up and started talking about himself. Talking about himself all night. In fact, I got mad because he didn't offend me. So I went around him. He was standing over against the wall. This is my sponsor today. He's got 38 years sobriety. I walked around to where he was, and I said, Charles, I hear what you said about yourself. So like the big book says, let him ask you. 
He he really he I really admit for it that night. He talked about himself so much that he got me enthused. And I asked him. I say, I hear what you said about people. What do you think I should do? Boy, what did I say that for? <laughs> he looked at me and he said, I was telling you what I did. He said, Frankie, what you do, I don't really give a damn what you do. That's your business. And this is what made me inquisitive. I had to find out more about this thing. You know, I remember Sarah at the hospital and Oral left before I did. Oral went back to his home 90 miles away and I went back to my home. And I was going to go back to the meeting. You know how we alcoholics are, good intentions. I didn't I didn't take a drink, but I went back to work. Got it back caught up in the thing. And I, and the meeting was right there in town. In Little Rock. Aura lived ninety miles away. And Aura wrote me a letter on June the thirteenth and he said, Joe, I'm coming back to Little Rock to the AA meeting. And I have the letter and I have framed it. And it's really something sacred to me. Because he said I would be back there for the AA meeting on E3. I don't have time to write you. It was a folded piece. It's a folded piece of paper he tore out of his kid tablets and wrote on one side. I don't have time to write you, but I will see you there. Very positive. Sort of like the master. Come with me. And it was that little letter that carried me back to the AA meeting. I had been right there in town like most drunks. I work, work, work with alcoholics every day. I know how they are. You know, alcoholic can get, uh, while he's drunk, he can go from, go from all the way to New York City on a drunk. When he gets sober, he can't get across town to an AA meeting. You know, that's peculiar. <laughs> but this guy, I went, I went back that night and I think this is where things really begin to happen in my life. So I was powerless of alcohol. My book said the solution to this is power. Actually, the first step is very simple. First step is talking about we are powerless. If you are powerless, the solution is power. That's the second step. If that be the case, then the main job is how do you find that power? That's the last ten steps. It's powerless, power. The job is how do we find that power? We have a plan program of action to take it. It will enable us to find a power greater than ourselves, which will solve our problems. And you know, I, I found the power of Alcoholics Anonymous that night. The power of the fellowship. Alcoholics Anonymous is a very therapeutic process. You know, I remember that night I went home and my wife said, well, what, what kind of meeting is it? I said, oh, a meeting. She said, what do they do? I said, they don't do much. They said, drink a lot of coffee and they smoke a lot of cigarettes. I said, it feel, makes you feel good. I believe I'm going to go back next week. And I think our book talks about that. It says, you know, in this big book, it, on, this, on the first chapter, it describes the solution to alcoholism. First chapter, that there is a solution. It, it writes the prescription for power. It says, we are average Americans right here today. Come from all sections of this country, many different occupations, many different social, religious, uh, different organizations. We are all, we are many, we're in this room tonight, there are many different groups of people, kinds of people, different, different occupations, different religions, different political background, different social background, different economic background. Right in this room, this is the most mixed up group of people that ever going to meet in this town. <laughs> we should never mix. We're so different. Usually people mix because of uh, religion, politics, uh, social background, economic background. They mix on that level. But we have none of those. We shouldn't even know each other. But between us, there's something different. There's a, as he said, there's a, a friendliness, an understanding that is indescribably wonderful. And this is an AA. There's something between us. And said, we're like the passengers on the great line. He describes this in this great parable. 
And we can see these people on this great ocean liner. There were many different kinds of people on this liner. Different social, different religions, different economics. And that was a long way from the steering section to the captain's table. That guy in the steering section had the wrong economics. <laughs> he was traveling bad. And that dude up there in the steering section was riding good. He had finery up there. And doing this voyage they should have never met. But in a moment of disaster, I think about the Titanic. When it hit that iceberg, when their behinds hit that water, they had something in common. They had a common problem. See me? And this is what binds us. We don't care where you work, what you make, where you go to church. See me? This is power. That's power in our hearts and arms. The power of the group. But then my book says this is not enough. The fellowship of alcoholics and I'm, I think that's one of the great things that, that is happening in the AA today. That we're dependent on the fellowship of alcoholics and I'm, Going to meetings, going to meetings. This, that alone is not enough. Because I say, you know, you can't go to, they say, go to 90 meetings in 90 days and you'll be all right. But it takes more than that. That's fine to go to 90 meetings, but you got to do more than that. You can't go to, TTA meeting for 90 days and become a parent. Not really. <laughs> there is something we got to do. So my book says the real solution to alcoholism this is this spiritual experience. The spiritual experience that produces a personality change sufficient to recover. And this comes as a result of the precise, specific step in the big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I thank God that I, you know, had people in those times that took the time. You know, this was a, in 1962, and you have to remember now, 1962 wasn't the best time to go be the first black in AA, you know, uh, in Little Rock, Arkansas, because you know what was going on in our, in our country at that time. Uh, and I showed up at AA at the wrong time. And I thank God for my sponsor. And my sponsor, his AA life was threatened because of me. I wonder what, I don't think I let any human being threaten my AA life, but his AA life was threatened because of me, but he took me. And I would go to the old dormitory where we had meetings every morning at 7 o'clock. This was my AA. I went to work at night, and I would go to my meetings with him every morning at 7 o'clock. And, you know, I remember my first week in AA, the first couple of weeks in AA, they would... I would go to meetings and finally my old buddy Neil that run the house, he called me over one night, one morning. He said, Joe, I need to talk to you. He says, you, you're welcome. He says, you can come to the meetings. He said, but don't stand around and talk after the meeting. And don't drink coffee. But come back. Come back. And I came back. I came back because I had a ticket. You know, you can't keep nobody out. It all it takes is a desire to stop drinking. That's the only requirement. Thank God I never would have made it. And I had a desire to stop drinking. I see a lot of people around AA that can't, they don't have a ticket. They ain't got a desire to stop drinking. And it might seem cold. But that's what my book says. If you ain't got a ticket, you have to get one. And you can hang around AA and drink this coffee, and you'll never get a desire to stop drinking. But if you go out there and drink enough of that booze, <laughs> you'll get a ticket. You know? So I had a desire to stop drinking. And they couldn't keep me out of Alcoholics Anonymous. And you know, finally, you know, I, uh, they begin to, to, I begin to take, apply these steps to my life. In those days, they would put you right through the step. When you came in you, they would say, hey, this is what you do. You know, nowadays there's so many people we don't know. Maybe we can't work with. Maybe somebody don't know they knew. Well, maybe we come from another group. But then in those days when you came, they knew you was new. I wasn't but three groups, and they know you everybody in town. And when you came, they get on top of you. They said, "This is what you do." I didn't know you could not do it. At this time, please stop your machine and turn the tape for the rest of the message. Thank you. At this time, please stop your machine and turn the tape for the rest of the message. Thank you. And so, you know, the first step was self-stumble for me. 
The first step, I realized I was powerless over alcohol. I, I had I had two problems. In fact, the fact that I couldn't drink was just one. That wasn't my main problem. My main problem was I was always trying to drink. Now, the doctor explained to me that the first step is very simple. I have an allergy to alcohol. I'm an abnormal person when it comes to alcohol. Now, it was hard for me to know that because when you're abnormal all your life, abnormal is normal to you. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know I was abnormal. But when I took a drink, I did this all my life, so how did I know it was abnormal? When I took a drink, I immediately wanted another drink. We were talking about uh, the night at the table, and that's true. The average social drinker, once he takes a few drinks, alcohol is a very toxic drug. It, it is, and the body responds to anything poison. It really has a way of telling you that. Now, the normal drinker, once he takes a drink, it makes him nauseous and dizzy, and he feels out of control, and he don't like that feeling. That's a normal response to alcohol. But I didn't feel that way. See, and as soon as they get that effect, they want to quit. Now, as soon as I got that effect, I wanted more. <laughs> See, I'm different. I'm just wired different when it comes to alcohol. Now, once I take a drink, I immediately want one drink, another drink, another drink, and I have an allergy. That's an abnormal thing. It never occurs to the average temperate drink. Normal people don't crave alcohol. And that was amazing to me. You know, normal drinkers get all they want every time they drink. Can you imagine that? <laughs> I, I never got enough. <laughs> never did satisfy that craving. So... If you if that's the way you are, you'll never be able to safely drink alcohol. You're allergic to alcohol. I can't drink safely. That's part of my problem. Now the other part of my problem is in my mind. The main problem of the alcoholic is in his mind. You know, I had this great obsession, this idea that overcome all other ideas. I had a great obsession that was obsession to drink. So between these two things, because of the physical allergy, I couldn't drink safely. Because of the mental obsession, I couldn't quit. And if you can't drink and you can't quit, then you are powerless over alcohol. Now, once we see the first step, then we can determine it's from the first step that I saw the solution. Because if you're powerless, obviously the solution is power. And since we can't work in the body, this power would have to work in the mind. We just can't do anything about that. Therefore, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. Now we can write the prescription. Power. You know, I think these two, two steps are so simple. And they're not new. This is a this is the way you solve problems. First you find what the problem is, then you find what the answer is, and then you do the job. So this is as old as mankind himself. Ain't nothing new about the concept of the step. You know, it was a a man many years ago in the big, big book. I love that book. And, and it was a, uh, it was a prodigal son. Now the prodigal son talked about three things that was lost. It wasn't just him. There was a sheep that was lost. And when the sheep was lost, it's the responsibility of the director. The shepherd directs the sheep. He lost it. It ain't the sheep's fault. It's the shepherd's fault. So the shepherd went out and found the sheep. And the woman lost the coin. It wasn't the coin's fault. She lost it. So she searched diligently. She swept until she found it. Then there was a prodigal son. He, he was a creature like me. He wasn't like the sheep and the coin. He had self-will. He was lost, right? But he left on his own. See, he got lost, but he left on his own self. He said, give me mine, I want to leave. And he went off and had a good time. It sounded like one of us, wine, women, and song, you know. And he got in trouble, and he was down there in the pig pen. Now, the shepherd found the sheep. The woman found the corn. And the prodigal son found himself. He, he came to himself. And he saw where he was. The first step. Then if he saw where he was, then he took the second step. He says, I believe that he can build at my father's house. <laughs> he came to believe after finding out where he was. Then he got up and took a practical program of action. See me? And he went back to his father's house. 
And I get in trouble about this part of this story. But after he got back, they had a big party. And they was having a good time. He had an old do-gooding brother. <laughs> you know, he was one of them. And his brother was up in the field. And he asked one of the servants, what's going on down there? I said, they're having a the party. They killed a the fatty cat. He said, what for? He said, your brother is home. Which one? He said, you mean that one's out been drinking wine and raising hell? And they're giving him a party? And I've been here working all these years, and they never had a party. They said, that's the guy that went out and started our night. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the second step showed us. The first step exactly shows the alcoholic where he is, really. And once we see where he is, and the second step says, we believe you'd be better over here. So really, those two steps just get us ready for the program. But we've got to have those two points, where we are and where we want to go. And then we have a precise step, ten steps of action, a planned program of action to go from point one to point two. Rarely have we seen anybody fail that thoroughly follows that path. And if you're over here and you want to get over here, the first step is a decision. The first step is a decision. And this is step three. We have to decide. Decision means to dissect. It means to cut facts in two. If you're an alcoholic, you got two facts. You can continue, continue as you are in sanity or death, or live life on a spiritual basis, and it's no decision. You've got two choices. And we choose. And we say at this turning point between these two things, and our book says over and over, that's the only two things we got with honesty. We'll make a decision. We alcoholics don't like either one of them. I told my sponsor, I don't like, he said, we don't care what you, he said, which one you want? We don't care what you like. <laughs> I said, well, it's obvious, you know what I mean? I didn't like it. You know what I mean? So I tell guys all the time, I, when I stood at the turning point, I was worried about what God was going to do in my life. I was thinking he was going to make a missionary out of me if I turned my life over to him. And it didn't say that anyway. It said, let's make a decision, too. So I made this decision. And this was the beginning. And this is what decision is the beginning. And to do that, I had to go to work to carry out this decision because step three was but a decision to turn my life over. So I had to go to work to carry out, to do some things to carry out this decision. Decision implies further action. In order for me to turn my will and my life will care of God, this is a continuous thing for the rest of my life. There are certain things within me that block me from God. And steps four, five, six, and seven, eight, nine, these are the steps that work to remove these things to block, that block me from God. There's certain things within me, my resentments and all, my conflicts with other people. God has been in my life. God was there. I've been there. He's been there all my life. There's certain things within me that block me from God's directions and God's will in my life. And these action steps, in step four, I identify these things. In step five, I talk to them about another person. In step six, I begin ready to let them go. In step seven, I ask God to remove them. And in step eight, you know, I went to work on my problems with people. Step eight and nine. And once these things were done, you know, the promises of the book began to unfold in my life. So I, I, I was able, I remember the first time in my life I was really able to comprehend the word serenity. I heard him talk about it down in the club. But when it became part of my life, for the first time that I remembered it, I remember this new piece. And then I had to, to go on with this pro for the rest of my life. There's certain things within me to block me. I will never remove all these things. The last three steps of this program I'll practice the rest of my life. I continue to watch for those things. I continue to watch for self creeping back in, for resentment and fear. I watch my relationship with other people in steps eight and nine. And I constantly work these steps, these first nine steps over and over on a daily basis. You're trying to clear away things that still block me from God. In step 11, I receive God's directions in my life. So much the whole problem to me is the changing of directions in human life. In step 3, I make a decision to turn over my directions. I clear away the things that block me from God. In step 11, I receive His directions. Look at all boiled down to my will, give up my will, and receive the will of God in step 11. And through the practice of these steps, you know, I've had, I had a great change in my life. Uh, it wasn't a sudden thing. It was like Bill said, it over a period of months. You know, I had a, 
I had a revolutionary change in my reactions to life. The old ideas were cast to one side, and the complete nuisance of the motives began to dominate my mind. I am no way near the same person that had to drink booze. You know, I, I think that the 12th step talks about it. We carry, this is the message we carry to the alcoholics. But I was just like you, Jimmy. You know, if you if you were like me and you knew here tonight, I was there. But as a result of practicing this program, I had a, a vital change in my life. You know, it's more than to say, let's go to meetings. I think we alcoholics, we have a vital message for other people, you know what I mean? And the first 100 gave us a message. First in this big book, Alcoholics Anonymous. And, you know, AA is more than, than, a, than a fellowship. You know, we are a vital vessel of information. Uh, and our job is to protect this information to, in this big book, to protect this program, to, to, to give this information that was so freely given to us for other people still yet to come. You know, sometimes it really makes me sick. You know, I just get tired of telling them, go to me, you'll be all right. And we don't really tell them what they got to do. And that's why I'm here tonight, because there were some people at that time that told me what to do. Now, I won't go into all the things that have happened in my life. as uh, the many, many things that have happened in my life. Remember, I, was, I always tell it, I was here at this old uh, place where I was going to meet. First, they wouldn't let me drink coffee. Isn't that awful? I'm here sober four or five years, and I go down there every day and work with people. Uh, it became my life. Uh, I would uh, spend all my mornings there on the way to work the first five years. I'm so about five years, and I guess, you know, they said they can't get rid of this guy. So after five years, I was serving on the board of directors of this place. I said, this is a hell of a thing. They want me to be on the board of directors, and they wouldn't let me drink coffee. Now they want me to. So I started working with people there and working with that program. Um, I, I started working with alcoholics on the county farm after I was sober about a year. This was a penal farm, and I went down there for about 10 years and work with the with the people in the that was locked up on the farm. Um, early in about 1969, 67, uh, then I think it was Governor Buffer was appointed appointed me to the ad hoc committee to set up the alcohol programs and drug programs in the state of Arkansas, and I served on that committee. And we began the early uh, treatment, early programs, and set up the treatment programs in the in the state. And after that became effective. I uh, was appointed by the next governor to serve as on the advisory commission, commission to that authority. And since then, uh, I've been secretly appointed to that. And and uh, for six years, I served on the state authority that governs and directs all the alcohol programs in the state of Arkansas. And for three years, I served as chairman of that authority. You know, God's grace is, is unbelievable. You know, here they wouldn't even let me go into a facility and to drink coffee in one and through the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and the power of this program. You know, I set out an authority that governed all the millions of dollars that control all the programs in their state for about 15 years. The miracle of Alcoholics Anonymous in human life. You know, I could, I could think of many things, and I think it's quite fitting in closing of now think about, you know, the message that was, was brought to me. Um, and where I would be tonight had and not Aura. And by the way, Aura, Aura never stayed sober. Uh, Aura brought me to Alcoholics Anonymous that summer, uh, to the first meeting. Aura got drunk again. Over a period of years, uh, when the detox centers opened up after three years in 1965, I went back to the, to the detox center. They called me. I went back there and there was Aura. And uh, they asked me to come and see him. I had three years of sobriety. And this guy was brought me the message. Uh, I went back, went to, went to his home, drove 90 miles to see him several times. And I think he was in detox center for about every three years for the next nine or ten years. And each time I would see him go down and I was getting more and more sobriety and he was getting worse. After ten years, uh, they brought him, I opened up the, the treatment center where I work today. And they brought him for me to help. And he stayed with me for a while. We made a little progress, and he left. And it was about three weeks after that he left, he was killed in an automobile. So this man never got what he gave to me, a sweet, 
decent little guy. I don't know much about God's grace. And I really don't know how it works. But it, it works in my life. I think, you know, when he brought me a vital message, and I don't know where I'll be tonight without these things, and this is what is so important for me. My whole life today is all about carrying this message to other people. You know, I, I really, I got other things to do, but the most important thing in my life is to see that this vital message is preserved and is passed on, you know, in its purest form, so that those who come may see a way. You know, I, uh, particularly in this, it's so fitting in this thing about being in this room, and one of my favorite stories is about a, probably it was a, a place similar to this. Uh, it was an old maestro who played in a cathedral. He had been there for many years. He was nearing retirement and it was a, he played a huge organ in the church. And he had been there and, and, and every evening this whole village would, would listen for him to practice. After many, many years, he, his time was up, and it was near retirement. He had to retire. A younger man was taking his place, and, and he sat there in the chapel for the last time that evening practicing on the Hughes organ. And while he was, he was just about, he was just about to finish in the, he was taking the key, he had turned the huge key in the organ, and he was putting it in his pocket, and he just got, got off of the, the chair, and he was headed toward the back, and he, Way in the back of the chapel, he saw a bright, young, shiny man with his music on his arm coming in the door. And he was leaving the church for the last time. They met about middle ways of the chapel, and the young, bright, young, young man stuck his hands out and said, Sir, please give me the key. And the old man, very reluctantly, reached down into his huge coat and gave the young man the huge organ key. Tears dropping down his eyes, he headed toward the back, and he had just reached the back door and was about to leave. When the young man had gotten to the organ and third the key, and then the organ began to play. And now the old man, the old maestro, was good. But the man he heard at the organ was a genius. It was Johann Sebastian Bach. And the young old man turned and said, Suppose I had not given him the key. And that's what I could say tonight. Suppose these people had not given me the key. And that's my responsibility. Suppose I don't give this key to those who shall suffer. We have a vital responsibility from receiving this in our lives. To carry this message to the alcoholic and practice these principles in all our affairs. Thank you and God bless you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.